Good afternoon. I am so glad that you're all able to attend today. We have some exciting things to share with you today. By way of introduction, my name is Delena Tonks. I'm the director of the Open High School of Utah. And I'll tell you a little bit of more, a little bit more about my school in just a minute. I want to first introduce you to what makes our school work regardless of the uh, curriculum that we use or any of the tech tools that we have, without the heart and soul of our school, which is my teachers, we would not function. So Emily, Jess, and Jill, stand up and give a wave. Round of applause for our <laughs> I also wanted to point them out so that afterwards, if you have questions, these are the ladies who can help you with any questions that you might have. Um, all right, I don't know why I did this. I put a picture of me up here. It's not like you don't know what I look like because I'm kind of standing right here. <laughs> so uh, my background is actually in French and Spanish education. I taught in a bricks and mortar for a decade. And then I switched over to an online school in Ohio, moved back to Utah after 13 years in the beautiful state of Ohio, and landed a position with the Open High School of Utah by being Maldi with a legislator, so I don't, I don't know how that works in job descriptions, uh, but it worked for me. So I know there are some legislators in here, I thought you would appreciate that. Okay, I'd like to get a sense for who we have here in the audience. It's helpful for me so I can tailor my presentation to your needs. If you work with grades K through 8, will you raise your hand? Ooh, a couple, okay. And I know you all, excellent. <laughs> grades 9 through 12. Oh, fabulous. Yes, you three, nine through 12. Okay, we're good. Uh, how many of you work with college students? Okay, fantastic. Uh, do any of you do adult ed type stuff? Okay, I didn't want to leave you out. Uh, and anybody else who's other or not applicable? What, tell me what you do. I'm a researcher at the Center for the Future of Arizona. Oh, okay. All right, fantastic. Who else did we have in here that was other? Yes. In uh, venture capital. You're Frank, right? Yeah. Ha, I recognize you from your picture. Okay. Don't <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> stalk <laughs> No, I'm not a stalker. I, he just, yeah. Um, okay, how many of you are teachers? How many of you are administrators? <coughs> Policy makers? Okay. Researchers? And any other? Oh, lots of others. Okay. Tech, tech people? What do you do? I, I manage a citizen science project and do a lot of professional development with teachers. Okay, fantastic. Well, regardless of your title and who you work with, I'm happy that you're here today. Let me tell you a little bit about the Open High School of Utah. Uh, the mission is first and foremost, and we try and filter all of the decisions that we make through our mission. It's our guiding or our organizing principle. The Open High School of Utah was founded in 2007 by Dr. David Wiley, who is putting on this conference. You're very familiar with him. We opened in 2009 with 125 ninth graders. We've expanded this year. We have 350 ninth through 12th graders who are full-time students. And then we also have 50 part-time students who take a course or two online due to some great legislation that was passed this year in Utah that allows students to take one to two credits online uh, even if they attend their, as they attend their, um, their district school. So it's a good piece of legislation that we have passed. Uh, I want to be clear that we are a fully online charter school. We provide laptops to our students. That's our infrastructure. And uh, we, we see them in person at activities. We do have prom and dances and all of the touchy-feely, fuzzy stuff that those of you that are in higher ed pretty much don't have to deal with uh, on a regular basis. And um, we serve students across the entire state of Utah. Our mission is to facilitate lifelong success by meeting the needs of the 21st century learner through individualized, student-centered instruction, innovative technology, service learning, and personal responsibility. Another component that I'd like to share with you is uh, our open educational resources, one of the reasons we're all here today. Unique to Open High School of Utah is our commitment to share the curriculum we have developed as an open educational resource usable by anyone at any time. 
This is what our curriculum feedback loop looks like. But in order to understand what this means, because it's just circles and lines and words right now, I need to tell you a little bit about the process that we go through to hire the heart and soul of our school, which is the teachers. We audition them. I get probably 300 resumes per position. And uh, as much as I love reading resumes, we figured out a tricky system to cull through those uh, quickly and official, efficiently. So we send everybody an email that says, congratulations, you've made it through to the next round of the interview process. Here's a list of resources, open educational resource sites, here's a list of tech tools, and if you'd really like to continue the interview process, then send us an email and we'll give you access to our learning management system. Guess how many people who do that out of the 300? Just for kicks and giggles. Five, 10%. Anybody else? A little higher. 20, 25. 20, 25. I get 10. 9, 10 people, not percent people. So they ask for the uh, they ask for the password. We let them in. We look at what they filled, and we look for certain things. We're looking for people who are teachers who are persistent. They don't get that email and go, eh, I don't really want to do that. They're like, okay, this is something that I want to do. We want to make sure that they're tech savvy. So we look at how much time it takes them to build the content. If it takes them five days to put together a 10 minute lesson, maybe their tech skills aren't right where we need them to be uh, to be able to build curriculum for the, for the Open High School of Utah. And we also look for screen presence. You've got to have a captivating personality to reach out and engage 14 year old boys, really. I mean, you've got to be able to reach through that computer screen and get them to engage and interact. And so those are the types of things that we look for. We hire the, the best of the best. We interview the top three that we find through that process. And this is one of the most important components to what we do at the Open High School of Utah and why the results that we have are uh, effective. Because we could have our open educational resource curriculum, we could have our high-tech 21st century tools, but without the personal connection and the level of communication that we have from our teachers to our students, it doesn't net the same results. So what this looks like, um, the curriculum, we hire our teachers to build curriculum the year before it's actually taught. So from January to June they're building. I hire a curriculum director who is phenomenal. We always say she could power a small city if we could figure out how to get her plugged in. Uh, she just goes and goes and goes. She touches every piece of curriculum before the students ever see it. She's looking for uniformity. We have guidelines, uh, you know, everything's aligned to standards, and we want to make sure that the formatting is the same for the students. So if a student logs into Emily's English class, they know what the quizzes and the assignments are. They know what the icons mean. It's all the same. If they log into Jill's um, math class or Jess's science class, they know where to find <coughs> things. So they don't have to spend time going, oh, I don't know how Mrs. Mordecai does stuff in her class. Uh, so we've had good results doing that. Um, the other thing I wanted to share with you, and I'll come back to this feedback loop a little bit later, is that our teachers are full-time. They work, I, I could say eight hours a day, but I know that oftentimes it's more than eight hours a day. They hold four hours of office hours every day where they're available to the students. And this is a critical component to the set, success of our students and also to the effectiveness of our curriculum and our school. So students get what they need when they need it. They open up their laptops, they start working through a class, they have a question, they find the teacher that day during their office hours and they get their question answered so that they can move on. They can work at their own pace and they're not relegated to 75 minutes of instruction if, whether they need 25 or, or more. Uh, the other four hours that they're not connecting with students, they're grading, and then they're tweaking their curriculum, and we make that a part of their job description, a continual improvement process on the curriculum, because we look at the outcomes. Uh, there's a lot, I've, I've heard a lot in the, the sessions today about peer review and upfront review of curriculum pieces and quality and how do you know it's good curriculum? We look at the back end of that. Is it doing the job that we hired it to do? Is it teaching the students what they need to know? And I'll talk more about that later. So what this gives us the ability to do is to tailor make our curriculum. If you don't like a, a chapter of your textbook, you can't rip it out and throw it away. I guess you could, but you couldn't do that, you know, it's not very effective to do that. 
Um, and so with OER curriculum, that's exactly what we do. If something's not working, we, we target that, we pinpoint it, we go back and we fix it, we enhance it, and we make sure that it's doing the job that it's supposed to be doing. Teachers tinker, it's what we do. If something's not working, whether you're in a bricks and mortar or a brick and click or a fully online setting, you change things, right? You, you fill in the gaps uh, with teacher-created materials. What that looks like for open high school is as the teachers are building the curriculum, they look at existing resources, and if they can't find something that fits the standards that we're aligning everything to, then they make it themselves. So the data. We have lots and lots and lots of data. I've had teachers tell me that I've ruined them that they are unable to go back to a bricks and mortar setting that doesn't have an online component or a learning management component because they don't have the access to the level of data that they have in the online environment. Um, so with the teachers, they tinker, they, they look at their curriculum. We also like to loop the students in. So we teach for a couple of weeks and then the teachers will start putting up polls. What was your favorite lesson? What was the most effective piece of content that you interacted with? Uh, simple questions to, designed to figure out what best meets the needs of the students in that particular class. That changes every year. So next year when we teach English 10 through for the third time, Emily will put polls in her classroom and see what, uh, what learning needs there are for that particular group, particular group of students and she can adjust things and tweak things and that's built into the teacher's job description. It gets us down to a granular level uh, to meet student needs. One of the most power thing, powerful things that we can do as a teacher is to target where the curriculum is working and where it's not. And one of the first places teachers look is at the assessments. And you can see on here, you can see that there are a lot of A's. Uh, what does that mean? How do we interpret that data, again, to best meet the needs of the students? Uh, we associate grades with concept mastery. Um, but the, the tests in this case not only gauge student uh, mastery, concept mastery, but also how well our tool is uh, that we're using to be able to judge the curriculum. And so if A students are getting questions wrong, we can go through and look at that question and say, eh, maybe it's a bad question. Maybe, maybe it's not. Maybe it's the curriculum, maybe it's the content that was taught that, that um, brought that question about. We have the ability to go back and change that, the content as well as the question. Teachers is able, are able to get down to the nitty gritty and examine immediate feedback. Uh, and they can tell how successful their tests are and their assessments. Um, they can look at how different populations scored. So do the highest score, uh, are, is that typically the A students? Are there B students that are scoring really low on four or five different questions? Let's take a look at that and you can uh, do a data striation to figure out what's working and what isn't. Then another interesting thing that we're able to do is to gauge the overall student use of course resources. <coughs> this is fascinating. You'll get kids that are bombing their tests and they'll come to the teachers and say, I need help, I, I don't understand the material. Well, you look back and see how much time they spent. They didn't watch any of the videos, they opened up one worksheet and looked at it for 30 seconds and closed it down. Well, it doesn't take a statistician to figure out what the problem is, right? They didn't spend enough time on the resources. So this is a great way to figure out where the students are spending their time and then it helps the teachers give good individualized feedback. Go back and watch the videos. Go back and do this worksheet and then you can come and talk to me and I'll be happy to help you. So it also uh, creates an efficient use of teacher time. Then we can go down and track individual and group use of course activities and assignments. That lets us know which ones are engaging and effective to the students and which ones may not be. And again, that's part of the continual curriculum uh, improvement process that they can go back and maybe put some more clickable content or an engaging activity in. Uh, and then we can look at it on an individual student level. Where are they spending the most time across their classes? Gives us good data to be able to help them out and be success successful at Open High School of Utah. We recently released 20 semesters of curriculum, all of our 10th grade courses that have been taught through and refined. 
Last year we, we released 10 semesters of curriculum, so we have a, a grand total of 30 semesters of open course curriculum. That's available right here at ocw.openhighschool.org. You're welcome to take a look at that. Um, they're great for the taking. We do not include our assessments for accreditation purposes, uh, but we're happy to give you a list of resources that we use to design our assessments, and you're welcome to create your own. The other thing that we do is we release, we'll be releasing version 2.0. So last year we released our 9th and 10th grade curriculum, version 1.0. We've tinkered with it, we've updated it, we've adjusted it, we've added stuff in. That will be released in January or February so that you'll be able to get the most updated version of our courses. So what? We do all this work with the curriculum, all this work with our teachers. Uh, what, what does it translate to? This is a really great, uh, we call it the DNA of open high school, and David Wiley actually did this for us. The blues are the A's, and you can see how successful the students are. Uh, the students go across this way. So you can see that there are some straight A students, and they're all blue. And then uh, some of them have all A's, and in one class they have a C. We've been able to extrapolate this data and get some fascinating comparisons for uh, what's working and what's not working for different subsets of students. We were able to have a completion rate, a passing rate, students passing their courses of 76.3% our first year that passed our courses, which is big in an online environment. I know that some of the other uh, online <coughs> schools, even in our own state, have very low completion rates and very low passing rates. And I firmly believe that it's because of our high-touch teaching model <coughs> with our teachers who are engaged with our students. We actually increased our passing rate last year to 80%. And then most states have criterion reference tests. A way to measure yourself against all of the other students in the state. All of our scores have been above average in apples to apples comparisons, meaning grades 9 through 12, and how they scored on English, science, and math. Um, David pulled some data for us a couple weeks ago from our CRT scores this year, and we're actually ranked sixth in the state for our science program compared to all high schools across the state. Not online, not charter, all district schools, high schools across the state. Um, again, that's a tribute to our, our teachers and their diligence in keeping that curriculum effective for the, for the students. Okay. This has been one of the most satisfying, rewarding career choices I have ever made. I, if you told me three years ago, five years ago, if you told me five years ago that I would be involved with something that connected me to people across the globe, I would say, well, of course, I'm a French and Spanish teacher. I take students to Europe. That's it's what I do. And if you would explain further, no, 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 this is what it's going to look like, I don't think I would have believed you. Um, we have uh, shared courses and swapped curriculum. We play Go Fish with our curriculum. I have a World Civ course. You have a U.S. History course. We'll trade. It's a lot of fun. Montana Digital, uh, doing great things in the state of Montana. We trade courses with them. Whittier Union High School District in California is doing good things. Uh, the director of that program has actually taken steps to start an open high school in California uh, to, to open in the fall of 2012, which is is uh, very exciting as well. We have courses and have gotten feedback from South America. We have people who are translating all of our courses into Portuguese and Spanish. Uh, Africa, China, Montana, California, New Zealand, and then a whole bunch that we don't know about. We went back and forth when we released our courses on whether or not we were going to make people sign in and tell us who they were. We decided against that because it goes against the whole open philosophy, right? Here's our stuff, use it. Just give us lots of information in return. Uh, we, we determined that it would be better to make it freely accessible and not have to log in. So we have Google, Google Analytics telling us where people are coming from, but we don't know specifically where it's going unless they contact us, which oftentimes they do. Um, I received a note from, uh, I, I was, um, I was in my office in August, and a man came in unexpectedly, hadn't made an appointment or anything, and said, I need to talk to the director. I have to talk to her. I'm, I'm here from Ethiopia. And I came out and was like, okay, have, 
how can I help you? And he said, I want you to know how much your courses mean to my students. We've been using your courses since you released them, and it's making a huge difference for, for the students at the school that he was in charge of in, in uh, Ethiopia. And I sent a note to my student, to my teachers that just said, I, I hope you can sleep well knowing that you are not only providing quality educational experiences for our open high students, but also for countless faces of many colors worldwide. How powerful is that? And the open educational resource movement is rippling across the globe. Uh, I, it took about a year for me to be an, an OER evangelist, like David likes to say. I, I wasn't, I'm like, really? You're just going to give stuff away for free? I'm like, how does that work? Really? This is why it works. Okay, I shared the story uh, about Ethiopia. We also were contacted by the Ministry of Education in New Zealand after the earthquake in Christchurch last February. They didn't have enough physical space to contain all of the students. And so what they did is they sent them to school half a day, and then they sent them home and they used part of our OER curriculum uh, to be able to keep the educational flow going for those students whose lives were so severely disrupted in the earthquake. I would like to issue a call to action. This is the best place to do it. Probably preaching to the choir a little bit, but dare to share. It's been the greatest journey. I've been privileged to be a part of this movement for the past three years, and I look forward to great things to come. And I will take questions now. Yes? Yeah, so well, well, one thing that I think about OER is that in many cases it hasn't, in general, it hasn't challenged pedagogical models. Um, so I think most sort of like OER production is for kind of a full frontal lecture mode and we replace whatever <coughs> materials in there with OER materials. And so to me, the sort of national conversation around the flipped crowd classroom is sort of the first thing to me that, that gets me thinking like, oh, now we're thinking about how having all this stuff actually like, let's not just think about making free stuff, let's think about having it change the way we teach. Um, you know, to, to, what, to what extent do you think you're in your teacher's experience with the open high school sort of contributes to that conversation about how OER doesn't just make free stuff available, but, but gives us opportunities to really rethink the way we, we create student learning experiences. Um, you guys want to take that one? Emily? Um, I think, because I'm not, I, I mean, yes, OER, that's how we built it. But I have the ability to talk to my students one-on-one. -on -one. And that is why I went into teaching. I didn't go into teach to seven from a classroom seven times a day and teach the same thing. I want to impact lives. And so I, I think if you ask any one of us here, that is one of the things that I enjoy the most. I get to actually teach. And so I get to work, know what's wrong, know what a kid is start struggling with, and actually work with them specifically on that. And so I think in that sense, yes. And I would like to add to that, too, that being able to have all these OER resources at our fingertips is helpful when we have, you know, a, a kid who could be in an honors class in a regular bricks and mortar school in the same class you have a special education student, they need two totally different things. Having all these resources available helps me much easier diversify and differ differentiate my instruction to reach my kids. You said your pass rate is 80%. Can you tell us about the other 20%? <laughs> They're the ones who typically do not open the computer. I, in addition to the tech savvy teachers that I hire, they have to have a professional stalker license. Um, and they chase the students down. And if, if we can get the kids to open the computers, then we can work with them and help them. There is a segment of the population who just is not interested in engaging and they just won't <coughs> open the computer. If you look to beyond it, why they don't know the computer, is it uh, socioeconomic grouping, is it family dysfunction, is it just a, a very rebellious kid? What kind of trends have All you of seen? All the above. Uh, so, so you can, do you feel that you beforehand you can already tell, okay, this kid most likely will be a risk kid. We, you know, do you have any sense like that as you start out with, with a new class? It takes, what, two, three weeks? to target those kids and we, we have a program, we call it the shepherding program, uh, where the teachers are assigned to track their, their sheep, their students, and to, to make sure that they know what's going on with them. 
Uh, they contact them once a week by whatever means necessary to make a connection with them. And they're not supposed to talk about school work. It's not a, hey, you're not doing your work, I'm calling you to get, in, you're in trouble type of a communication. It's, how are things going? How can we help you be successful? And m a lot of the students respond really well to that. Some of them aren't interested. They, we use Google Chat, and it, once they see, if, if we see a student that's green-lighted, and we go after them, and they shut down, and they, you know, they close their computer, they're not interested in that. So I, we do what we can to engage those students. Any other questions? This seems to be a self-select group that's going to go to an online school, right? So I would expect that, again, most of them would be successful. Or that I would really expect that the parents would be right on top of them. More so than the other people. If you could see my we teacher's wish. faces, <laughs> you would know that that, that sounds so they good. Are just but it's what's your feedback to this teacher? I mean, to the parents. What's the link with the parents? We copy them on we, most Yes, you know, they see everything that we talk to the kids. We call the parents as much as we call, the, call our students. And we have, just like in a brick and mortar, we have a vast gamut of parents, parents who are um, right there engaged, and parents who um, say, throw their hands up in the air and say, I don't know what to do either. So yeah, it runs the gamut. So to your question, we have a broad cross-section of students. We have the, the high population, the high achievers that don't want to sit in the classroom and be taught to the middle. But we also have a, a very diverse lower <coughs> echelon population, IEP students and 504 students whose needs are met because they can get the individualized attention that they need. And they, they are more successful in this setting than they are in other settings and, and they've started gravitating towards us. Our special ed population um, has increased, I think we had nine students for the past couple of years and we've got 48 this year. And so they know that they can get their needs met and the doors are open. How about the feedback, not from your parents, but from the general public or from public schools? <laughs> I think it's the best kept secret in Utah right now. <laughs> well, unfortunately, <and> it, <laughs> unfortunately. There's, there's been resistance because we are disrupting the status quo. Uh, we're offering an option and the education establishment sometimes sees that as taking dollars away from them. But it's really not. Taxpayer dollars pay to educate students, and we're doing that as well as the uh, district schools. So, yeah. How many of the full time virtuals do you have in Arizona? The, the big boys, the K 12s, connections? We have K 12 and connections. Open High School uh, are the three fully online schools in Utah, and then there's the state one that's electronic high school. Oh, okay. okay. Yes. Where do the teachers oh. find resources? Do you give them a list of my uh, recommended? Content providers, and also, is there any <coughs> training related to developing curriculum using OER? You guys want to take that? Sure. Um, when I first got hired, I was given a list of places I can go to gather information. I've also found some on my own, and as the school has grown and we've gotten new teachers who also go out and seek out other options than the list they were originally given, our list just keeps growing and growing. It's really collaborative on that. Um, in terms of training for when you're hired to have to build stuff, our curriculum director is great. She gives everybody a training and then is always available for additional questions as are the teachers who have been there a little bit longer for an informal training network too. Okay, and we have our blue shirt guy standing up the back, which I think means he wants me to stop. I'm happy to answer questions. My teachers are happy to answer questions. Thank you for coming.